Well, good morning, TNCC. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Peter and uh, Sister Stephen and the entire leadership, all the pastors, and especially Karen for having faith to believe that at this time of the year that the church will be open and we can have a youth conference. That's prophetic, I tell you. Thank you so much for trusting me with your young people. I tell you what, what I have witnessed the last three days, four days, is the real manifestation of the grace of God in these young people. It's super powerful what God has been doing and going to continue to do through these young people. When I first wanted to be in the youth ministry, somebody really discouraged me. They said, are you sure you want to be in the youth ministry? I said, why? He said, now, I've been in the youth ministry for so long. He said, after being in the youth ministry, I realized why some animals eat their children young. <laughs> Thank God I did not give up trusting in the young people's life. I've been serving for the last 35 years in ministry and I've been having the privilege of speaking to young people. It's a great honor. Hey, I tell you how to, how to remain young. You serve the young people, they will keep you young. <laughs> That's one of the secrets, how to remain young. Praise God. What a blessing, what an honor to be here, Pastor. Thank you so much for trusting me. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for your word. Your word is life and that you will bring life and life in abundance in the midst of fear, in the midst of all the pandemic scare. Lord, in the midst of all the uncertainty, we ask for a deposit of life that Jesus promises us. And we are open, ready to receive. In Jesus' name we pray. If you agree, say, Amen. 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 Well, Christmas is just a couple of weeks away from now. And I want to share with you this message called Jesus God's glory with us. I mean, who else can we talk about when we talk about Christmas? Jesus is truly the God's glory with us. I like 2 Corinthians 4 verse 6. It says this, For God said, Let there be light in the darkness. How many of you think that lots of darkness around with this pandemic? And God said, Let there be light in the darkness has made this light shine in our hearts so we could know the glory of God that is seen in the face of Jesus Christ. In other words, the scripture tells us the glory of God is seen in the face of Jesus Christ. When I was, uh, when I was a student in the US, I worked as a mover. We moved furniture. And my, my boss gave me a key. I was made a supervisor. He gave me a master key that could open over 900 doors and all, uh, apartment doors and office buildings. One master key. I can walk into anybody's room in the middle of the night if I want to. But just like that master key, Jesus Christ is the master key into every need that we have. He's the master key for this Christmas and He's the master key for every breakthrough and victory that we are seeking for. Come on, somebody. He is the master key. Amen. Now, I want to start off by telling you a story from the Old Testament when the glory actually departed. And that story is found in 1 Samuel chapter 4 and reading from verse 21. And this is how it goes. The wife of Phineas and of course the brother Hophni, the two uh, sons of Eli the high priest, they were re actually really, uh, really um, two children who really did not carry the heart and the passion of the father who is Eli the high priest and the moral degradation of the nation was so bad that God has literally you know what wanting to bring them to a place where they would trust him even more so she named the boy Ichabod because uh, the battle happened and the Philistines defeated the army of Israel 34,000 soldiers died and in the process the Ark of the Covenant was captured in the process you know, Hophni and Phinehas, the sons of the high priest, died. And so the messenger comes back home and tells the wife of uh, Phinehas what has happened. And Eli, the high priest, being man of a big size, heard the bad news, collapsed to the back, broke his neck, and he died. The high priest died. The Ark of the Covenant was captured by the Philistines. The sons of the high priest died. And the wife of Phinehas, who just gave birth and said, look, this baby is no good news for us. And the, they called the baby Ichabod, which means the glory has departed. So she named the boy Ichabod saying, 
the glory has departed from Israel because the capture of the ark of God and the death of the, her father-in-law and her husband. She said, the glory has departed from Israel for the ark of God has been captured. Now, this is the sad news. So, Ichabod actually means the glory has departed. Now, two things have happened. Number one, the high priest died. Number two, the Ark of the Covenant has been captured. As you know, these are the two important identity, identity when we always refer to Jesus in the New Testament, when we always refer Jesus as the Ark, and we always, because the Ark is the presence of God, and we always refer Jesus as the great High Priest. Now, when these two... Uh, most important identity for the nation has been robbed away from them and that's why they say the baby actually that was born typifies the condition that they were in in the time and the season where God's glory has been departed when this baby was born the glory has been departed now what is the word glory means the, the word glory in he, in Greek means doxa well if you read the Theus lexicon, it says glory actually means honor, praise, good opinion of someone. That's what glory means. Glory also can mean magnificent. It also means excellence, preeminence, dignity. And another important word that we find in Theus lexicon about, about the word uh, doxa or glory is the word grace. The word grace is mentioned when we refer to the word the glory of the Lord. You know, the word glory also signifies majesty, God being majestic. So this is what has been completely destroyed or removed from Israel because the high priest died, the Ark of the Covenant has been removed, and Israel now declare, Ichabod, the glory has departed. Please don't call your children's name Ichabod. Some people get very, very strange ideas. You say, that sounds, sounds very nice. Uh, sounds like a, a Spanish football player, Ichabod. Please don't. It doesn't carry a good name. It means the glory has departed. But I've got good news for you. Because in Luke chapter 2, verse 8 and 9, and there were shepherds, the story of Christmas, and there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them. And guess what? What was lost the glory, the grace, the magnificence, the preeminence, the glory, the majesty of God that was, de was departed at the, at the, when the high priest, one high priest and the ark that was lost. Now, the birth of another child, the Bible tells us, just as the angels came, the glory of the Lord shone around them and the angels were terrified. And you know what? Let me tell you. This is the good news. What that baby lost, what the, the birth of that baby typifies a terrible scenario and a circumstances, glory of God departed, but the birth of this baby brings the glory of God and restores. And at the birth of this baby, what was lost? The high priesthood position was lost. The Ark of the Covenant, the presence of God was lost. But when this baby was born, let me tell you what, he is not an image of the high priest. He is not the image of the ark, but he is the ark of God. Come on. And he is the great high priest who knows the feelings of our infirmities. Come on, somebody. This is the high priest. What was lost? What was lost? When the glory departed, now I'm telling you, you and I, we are living in the best time ever because God has decided that He is going to revisit His people and the glory is back in our life. Come on, somebody. The glory is back in your life. And let me tell you, this glory is not just something glorious. It's not something that we sing, glory, and we don't know what in the world it means. This glory affects you. This glory is going to change your life. This glory is changing your life. This glory is going to help us fight this pandemic. This glory is going to help you face your darkest moment of your life. Because the scripture says when, the Bible says that when God spoke into the darkness, when God spoke into the darkness, 2 Corinthians 4, 6, 
And this is what it is when God spoke into the darkness, that God's glory came and God's glory shining in the face of Jesus. And this Jesus is the one that God has sent for us. And in Scripture tells us in John chapter 1, verse 14, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father. Everybody say, full of? Grace. And? Come on, full of? Grace. And? That's what it is. You know, another translation says this, The Word became fleshed and moved into our neighborhood. Whew. The Word became flesh and moved into our neighborhood. That means God, that means we all are waiting for a breakthrough to find God. What, is, what are your, all your colleagues and friends do? They are finding and seeking for some sort of meditation, a portal, a door that will open up, hoping that they could probably get connected to the superior powers that they have heard that could be something that is so mystical that they want to get in touch with. But like, tell your friends, God has a better news for you. They don't have to rip open in order to go through a portal to touch God. But God in His mercy has left heaven's greatness and come down and become man and live among us. Full of grace, full of truth. That means, you know what? God has decided to check into our neighborhood and every time when he checks into our neighborhood, he brings a basket of gift to let you know that he has just moved in. You know, when we move into somebody, we want to say hello to our neighbor. We bring some, we bake a cake, we say hello to them. And God has brought a basket. And in that basket, there's two wonderful gifts. It's called grace and truth. Come on, someone. It has got grace and truth. He is the favor of God. And he's saying to you, if you want freedom, then you need the truth. Because it's the truth that will set you free. Come on. He is the truth. And it's the truth will set you free. Now you know why the grace, the, the word glory is not just a theological term, but it is a term that Jesus spoke in, in John chapter 8, verse 32, that He is the truth. And He says the truth will set you free. When He came, He came to do this one business, to set people free. And in that basket that he came and checked in in our neighborhood, he wants you to know that he is that freedom for this mankind. Come on, people. We have this freedom in our life. Well, every day we look into the news and the news will tell us the facts. I mean, all those scientists, medical doctors and all that, that's printing out all the results of how many infections in Selangor, how many deaths. Those are facts. I'm so glad the Bible didn't say as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and facts. Facts will put fear in your heart. Truth will set you free. Come on, people. Facts will put, put fear in your heart. Yes, yeah, true. I mean, you get your doctor's report and the medical report of your blood test. That's, those are facts. Hey, doctors are good people. They fight the same thing that pastors fight. We fight against disease and death and all that, right? But they, they give you the facts because that's what their job requires them to do. They cannot just wing it. They can have to give you the facts. But if you live by the facts, you will have fear. But if you live by the truth, you will walk in freedom. Come on. Because the Bible says the truth will set you free. And that's exactly why He came. And that's why Jesus came. And that's what Christmas is all about. Let me tell you, I love Christmas. I don't know about you. I love Christmas and I love to preach about Christmas stories. In my church next week, we, we are doing a Christmas production. It's a, it's a 15 minutes movie as well as a live performance on the stage. And we have five shows. I'm so excited because I'm going to preach in all that five shows. And I want to tell the world that God has come to bring freedom. That the, the Word became flesh and dwelt tabernacle among us. And you know what? And the Bible tells us not only that He dwelled among us, but He brought with us, with Him, a gift, grace, favor. In a time like this, favor. And so I think all the more the believers need to shout about Jesus, about what He has done. And all the more believers have to talk about Christmas. Christmas is not just something... Like, you know, in my, in my church, we have these Christmas trees and we have all these boxes nicely wrapped with a big bow 
and I'm never worried that somebody will come and steal it because I, to me, I, I'm not worried. It's outside in the foyer, it's outside in the lobby. Anybody want to take it, take it. You know why it's empty? <laughs> I think that's what we have done probably sometime. We have wrapped Jesus nicely and emptied him of all the purpose and power that he brings in our life. Because Jesus is the master key. Truly, he is the master key. Now, I mentioned to you that my title is called Jesus, who is God's glory among us. Jesus, God's glory among us. Did I? Oh, yeah. Yeah, there you go. Jesus is God's glory among us. You know, one of the names of Jesus in the, in when, we, when we celebrate Christmas, when we read the biblical Christmas narratives, is the name Emmanuel. God with us. Emmanuel. God with us. I tell you, this name Emmanuel, Emmanuel, El, you know, when you hear the Hebrew names of God, El Shaddai, Elohim, El Elyon, you know, and, and all the power packed representation of God when we call him Elohim. That's the name of God. When the Bible refers to him as Yahweh Elohim, Yahweh is the covenant, very covenantal, relational name of God. Yahweh, Elohim, is the power of God. So when God sent His Son, He decided that the name of His Son will be Emmanuel. That is, that is with us, God. With us, God. Of course, when we read it in Hebrew, it's Emmanuel. I mean, in, in Greek, it's Emmanuel, God who is with us. He's with us. How can God become man? So somebody said, if God became man, surely along the way, right, his, his deity ship would have been diluted when he came to earth. Now, look at Matthew chapter 1, verse 21 to 23. This is the, the Christmas uh, narrative from the Gospel of Matthew. And he will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. For he will save his people from their sins. So all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. You know, in the past, in, in, in the biblical records that we see, when God visited Adam in the garden, in the cool of the day when God walked, God wasn't man. God was who God was in heaven. He, he came down and walked where man, man was. When God was speaking to, to Moses, you know, and put him in the cleft of a rock and just his back passed by, it was God in his actual position as God in history. And then when, when, the, when the presence of God tabernacled in the place where the children of Israel met, and that was the real presence of God, in history but at this time god decided he's going to leave heaven and come down and become man i i used to be a lecturer in kdu Penang. i was a lecturer teaching there and one of the privilege i had i had the privilege to teach a subject in humanity because i teach the american transfer program and so they told me uh, can you teach this humanity paper called World Religion? I say, of course. I'll teach World Religion. It's called Religion from the Outside. You just touch and go. You don't go into very deep like going into a seminary. So I teach Hinduism, Buddhism, Taoism, Sikhism, Jainism, Islam, all the isms, different, different, and Christianity, every religion. And one thing really stood out is this. Many great founders of World Religion, they were ordinary men. But out of reverence, respect, and honor, they have been venerated to become God. But you know what I found? Only Jesus. He was God. He decided that he's not going to enjoy that position. You know, even though he can. But he decided to become man. Who would ever do that? If you are, if you are God, would you want to live and come and suffer this pandemic? I <laughs> know you don't want <laughs> Say, I'd rather be there and surrounded by all these angels and get all the glorious covering and protection. Hey, who wants to come down? But he left heaven. He was God. He became man. He was God and he decided to become man. And how is that 
possible? You know, how is that possible? The question that always we ask is, how did God become man? Now, do you know that God, Jesus, did not lose his power as God? He did not lose his power as God. Some of us, we watch Superman, you know, when Superman was in his planet, right? Then when he came down to earth, you know, until he has this sunlight shining on him, then now Superman will be very weak until he flies to the place where he can get all the sun and then his cell all charged up, then he becomes Superman again. Then when he sees the, the, the kryptonite, he becomes very weak. Sometimes we think that when God was God in heaven, he became man, he became weak. No, he didn't. He was fully God and he was fully man. Look at the scripture explained to us in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 13. The sun... Oh, hallelujah. I love this, this verse. The Son, Jesus, radiates God's own glory. He is not like Superman sucking up all the radiation of the Son. He radiates God's glory. Come on. And expresses the very character of God. And He sustains everything by the mighty power of His command. When He had cleansed us from our sins, He sat down in the place of honour at the right hand of the majestic God in heaven. Colossians 1.15 tells us, Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. See, He's really God. He is 100% God, 100% man. How did this work? How did this work? So we say, okay, I'm going to drink coffee. Pure black coffee. Then you drink the coffee, you feel the bitter taste. You say, am I add some milk? Do you know when you add milk, right? It will not become, you will not have the taste of 100% milk or 100% coffee. You will have a mixture. So we think like this. When he was God, he came down, become man. Surely something mixed. How do you explain this in theology? Well, if you, in theology, there's a term that is called hypostatic union. Hypostatic union, the simplest way to explain is this. Two nature in one person unmixed forever. Two nature in one person unmixed forever. Jesus is 100% man. He's 100% God. Nothing was reduced about him. And he came as man because he loves you and me. And Philippians 2, 6 and 7 tells us that. Christ himself was like God in everything. But he did not think that being equal with God was something to be used for his own benefit. Isn't that awesome? He didn't want to, be that, to use that for his own benefit. But he gave up his place with God, made himself nothing. He was born as a man, became like a servant. Hypostatic union is the place whereby two natures in one person, unmixed forever. So when Jesus came, and you wonder how that at the place when he just finished teaching and he tells the disciples, how many bread you have? He's looking for bread. At the same time, in another place, he's telling us he's the bread of life. At the tomb of Lazarus, he's crying. But at the same time, in Revelation 21, he's telling us that he will wipe away all the tears. Come on, someone. Listen, in Mark chapter 4, when he was sleeping and the storm came and the storm affected his sleep because the disciples got worried. But at the same time, let me tell you what, he was walking on top of the water. Hallelujah, in, Mark, in Matthew chapter 14. How come the storm can affect him at the same time he can walk on the storm? That's why this is what it is. Two natures in one person, unmixed forever. At the same time, at the cross, Jesus cried, I thirst. But at the same time, he said, I am the living water. Come on, somebody. This is the Jesus you have. This is the Jesus you have. Fully man and fully God. How many of you know that the name Emmanuel is loaded? Actually, you know what? When God called him Emmanuel, this is God. God is with us. Not that he's created the world. He went up to heaven and he said, guys, all the best. May the force be with you. <laughs> Whatever force that is. No, he decided to come and be with you. God is with you. You know, but today we are hearing a lot of with you. Delta with you. Omicron with you. Hey, after Omicron, what, huh? what else? Huh? Maybe Decepticon will be with you. 
After Decepticon, Megatron will be with you. You know, some kind of a crown is going to come. When is this going to be over? God decided in order to counter all these crowns that He decided that He would send His Son. And He said, My Son is with you! And this is Christmas! My Son is with you! For everyone who's feeling the fear, who's feeling the fear, God knew this 2,000 years ago. And He has decided that He will fill His Son's name with Emmanuel because the name Emmanuel, which is God, is loaded with all the characters of God. Let me, just, let me show you. In the Old Testament, God is called Elo Elohim, the Creator. But hey, come on. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 16 and 17, the Bible says everything that was created was created by Christ, through Christ, and in Christ. All the creation. The name Elohim is the name Jesus. Listen, one more name. The name I Am. I Am. God spoke to Abraham and said, I am who I am. I am who I am, God said to him. What's your name? I am. Hmm. What's your name? <laughs> I am. <laughs> you know what? That's the name of God. In, in, Mark, in John chapter 8, verse 58, Jesus said, before Abraham was, I am. This is the name of Jesus. And you know, the word Adonai, boss, you know, capital L and all lower casing L-O-R-D is different than all the uppercase L-O-R-D, which is Yahweh. Adonai means boss. But isn't that what we always call him in Romans chapter 10, verse 9? If you believe with your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord. Amen. Listen, his name is already the summation of the entire power and backing of God's purpose and presence. Listen, we also call him as Jehovah Rohi, the Lord my shepherd. Isn't that in John chapter 10, verse 11, that Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. You know, in the book of uh, 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 Joshua, when Joshua was facing the captain of the army of the Lord, he was known as Jehovah Sabaoth. And Jesus said, Jesus said, hey guys, don't touch. Don't, uh, leave them alone. They, they came with a purpose when they came to arrest him. Jesus said, remember his name in the Old Testament is what? The Lord Jehovah Sabaoth, which means the Lord of hosts, the Lord who is a mighty warrior. Jesus said, if I want, I just snap my finger, I can summon 10,000 angels. He is not trying to be like God. He is God. And He has decided to be with us. If Christmas is just another Christ religious routine, we lost the true purpose of living in this world. We'll be like the rest of the people out there who do not know that God decided to become man. He decided to be, to feel you, to know you, to respond to all your needs. I tell you, I can go on. His name is called El Elyon, which means the Lord, high and mighty. In the New Testament, Jesus is mentioned by Paul in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 21. He is seated high above, far above every power, principalities, and authority. You mean God in the Old Testament is Jesus? Yes. That's why His name is called God with us. That's why Emmanuel, everything about God is loaded in the name. And you know what God decided to do? He decided to give that name for us during Christmas. Because He doesn't want your Christmas to be purposeless, hopeless. When we did this play in our church, somehow, I don't know, Star newspaper picked it up. And the reporter came and interviewed us. So she asked, uh, I asked before, she asked, I asked her, so after you've taken the pictures of our backdrops, our decoration, our, which church are you going to? She said, uh, no, yours is the only church. Oh, I, th I thought to myself, wow. Two things came to my mind. Number one, we are absolutely crazy. <laughs> do this during the pandemic. Or, oh, number two, we have a purpose to speak about Jesus. Like your, 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 your youth conference, huh? one thing. I have never heard anybody else doing one thing, youth conference in the middle of, uh, when we just open up, you know. That's courage. You guys are trendsetters. You guys are history makers. You are doing something. I'm not saying this because I'm invited and hopefully will be invited again. No, but because this is the fact. And then she asked me this question. 
Pastor, why are you all doing this? I said, praise God. Thank you for asking. I was hoping you would ask this question. I said, you know, our prime ministers, presidents, kings, epidemiologists, virologists, all got no answer for this pandemic. We don't have an answer for this pandemic. But we have hope. And we're not going to keep this hope like a light, you know, under the basket. We're going to let it shine up on the hill, man. This is the hope we need to speak about. And I say to her, because the world is filled with anxiety, fear, depression, we want to speak the hope. I'm so glad. The newspaper was, uh, article was carried a couple of days later and she put the exact word inside. We want to give hope in this time. Come on, people. That's what Emmanuel is all about. That's what it's all about. That's what is Christmas. Because God is with us. And that's why we want to talk about. Now, the next important question is, why did, he be, why did God become a man? Why did God become a man? This is such an important question, you know, and I want to give you the answers to it. Number one, He wants to feel us. Have anybody tell you this? I feel you. Liar, feel you. Some people say, I feel you. Really? They, they can feel you? How? Look, you know, in, in, in Genesis chapter 22, verse 12, at the time when, when Abraham was about to sacrifice his son, and Abraham's going to plunge the knife, and the Lord said to him, No, Abraham, don't, don't. Because God said, Because now I know. That you really fear the Lord. You see, God put himself in the position of Abraham and tells him, I now feel you, Abraham. I feel you. Jesus can be the only person who can say this. Nobody can feel my shoes. Because he was God and he became man. So that we can say, I know Jesus has filled into my shoes. Isn't that awesome? Number two, he knows our weaknesses. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15 and 16. Verse 15 says that he's the great high priest who knows the feelings of our infirmities. And then verse 16 says, because of that, he feels, he knows the feelings of our infirmities. And I ask you, why didn't Moses become the high priest? Huh? I mean, he was a Levi, so is Aaron. I mean, Moses is probably more, carries more weight in his, because of his exposure with the palace of Pharaoh. Why didn't he become the high priest? Why did, why did they pick Aaron, his brother, to become the high priest? You know why? Because Moses has, has always lived a big bulk of his time, 40 years of his life, up in the palace of Pharaoh. He does not have his fingers on the pulse of the people. Aaron has been going around to, in the grassroots of the people's needs His finger was at the pulse of the people And that's the reason why When God was looking for a high priest He wasn't looking at Moses Because Moses had 40 years Of all the influence of the palace life He doesn't know how people feel But Aaron can And that's why God raised Aaron up Because his finger was in the pulse of the people Your high priest Jesus You know why he became man? His finger in the pulse of your need he knows your financial problem. He knows your tomorrow's fear. He knows what's happening in your marriage. He knows what's happening. He can feel. And Bible says that he was tempted at every point. That every point and everything that we go through at every juncture of our life, he felt it but yet did not commit sin. And because of that, he said, because of that, I know how you feel. Now I'm opening a door for you all. Come boldly to the throne of grace. Not a throne of judgment, not a throne of, uh, let me see how, um, no. Come boldly to the throne of grace because I know you, I feel you, I understand you. I know you will not make it without me. So come, come. This is why he became man. This is why he became man. I got five more minutes. The Bible tells us that he came to break the power of the devil. You know, in Hebrews chapter 4, in Hebrews chapter 4, um, uh, verse, uh, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14 tells us this. Hebrews 2, 14 says that because God's children are human beings, we all are human beings, and what are we made of? Made of flesh and blood. The Son also became flesh and blood. Hallelujah. There you go. He became flesh and blood. Why? Why? For only as human beings could He die. God cannot send angels. 
because you try to nail an angel on the cross, you cannot because angels are spirit. Lah. Angels are spirit. You cannot cross to nail them to the cross. And because of that, he has to be a human being so that he could die. And only by dying could he break the power of the devil. Hallelujah. And who had the power of death? So he destroyed the power of the devil and he snatched the power of death so that you can walk into life and not let death control you. Hey, we're all going to die sometime. Anybody say amen with me? We all are going to die sometime. It's only the time is that difference. So we're going to die. But when we die, we don't have to be afraid. That's why we're not afraid of COVID because God is our protector. Because we all are going to die someday. And we are not scared of death because He has taken the power of death. You know, if he has not taken the power of death, but you say, but pastor, we'll still die. What? Yes, but you won't die the second death. We all will die this physical death. You born twice, you only die once. But if you born one time, you will die two times. Here and up there. Eternal separation from God. We were born two times. Born from our mother's womb and born spiritually. Hallelujah. We will only die once. Die here on this earth. And when you go there, we have everlasting life. Come on. That's why He took away the power of death. He took away the power of fear out of you. And that's why we can come to church. Oh, it's so quiet in TNCC. Am I speaking to a Baptist church? I'm from a Baptist church. I say it's so quiet here. I say that's why you can come back to church. Because God took the power of death. Let me tell you, He knows your feeling because He knows that when He was born, there was no room for Him. Do you know there was no room for Jesus? Isn't that sad? But aren't you glad that in John chapter 14, verses 1 and 2, this is what the scripture tells us. It tells us, don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God, trust also in me. There is many more than enough rooms in room in my father's home if there were not so would not i have told you that i'm going to prepare a place for you can you imagine when he was born there was no room for him but in john 14 verse 2 he can tell you in my father's house there's many mansion many rooms he knows how you feel that's why he came god become man Ah, this is interesting. He went through three lockdowns. You know he went through three lockdowns? Hey, hey you think you're the only one went through MCO 1.0, 2.0, 3.0? Please lah. In Hokkien, we say, tolong tampo. Please, please. You're not the only one went through three MCO lockdowns. Hey, you read Bethlehem, right? His mother and father actually went to Bethlehem not for some honeymoon, you know. They went there to see the, the pengarah jabatan hasil dalam negeri from Rome. <laughs> The IRS director, because they need to register to get their, their themselves registered. Then, and in the in the place of Bethlehem, suddenly Mary went, "Honey, it's happening. The baby is coming." Hey, they didn't plan to stay in Bethlehem, lah. And you know, if a woman gives birth in in a place, she can't just get up next day, go back to their hometown. No, he got a lockdown. One point zero. Then he went, then the, then the angel came to him and said, don't stay, in, don't stay here because Herod is going crazy. Go to Egypt. Egypt was not the plan. He went to Egypt. MCO 2.0. Then the uh, Bible says, he was coming, a father was coming back because Herod died and he was going back to the land of Judea, the Bible tells us. But an angel came and told him, no, Herod's son Achilles is still the ruler and warned him not to go back to Judea. And, and, and in, listen, listen. And, and the father went to a place called Nazareth so that it is prophesied he will be known as Jesus of Nazareth. It wasn't planned. Again, MCO 3.0. We complain that God, we, you don't understand us. He had an MCO 3.0 before you and I and this went through. That's why he became man. Come on, give him praise, somebody. Come on, give him praise. Listen. He knows the constraint of time. Do you know he knows the constraint of time? Can you imagine being stuck inside the womb of a, of a woman for nine months? Hey, he's God, lah. Fully God, fully man. He has to confine himself in the womb. Waiting for time. I'm sure people come to the father's shop, you know, carpenter or the father. And people say, Joseph, can, I, can you prepare a table for me or not? Uh, you know, I need it three days. Joseph said, hey, cannot, lah. Festive season. 
three weeks, Jesus sitting there thinking, Daddy, if only you let me be God. I can just snap my finger in three seconds, the table will all be ready. I, all the wood in the, on the forest will listen to my voice and they will be cut and they will be polished, they will arrange, all the nails will all come together at the snap on my finger. But Jesus have to hold back. <sighs> hold back. <sighs> you know what? You know what's our problem? Biggest problem during MCO? Time. We all lost control of time became very fearful. God business cannot open. God school cannot go to school. God girlfriend cannot date. And we are worried about time. True or not? He knows the constraint of time. Because we live in planet Earth, 24 hours, 365 days a year. If you live in Jupiter, one cycle, one is, ours is 24 hours, right? In Jupiter, only 10 hours. Don't be a student in Jupiter. Your, your teacher tell you, Besok kerja rumah, eh, tomorrow pass up your homework. Ten hours, five hours sleeping already. But if you live in Venus, Venus is the best place to be student. You know why? 5,832 hours for one circle like that. 5,832 hours on one circle like that. That means uh, it's 243 days. Fantastic life to be a student. Your prof tells you, pass in your work tomorrow. He said, yes sir. 243 days later, I will pass in to you. But I tell you something, listen. Don't date in Venus. Dating is prohibited in Venus. Because if you ask your girlfriend, if your girlfriend asks you, darling, when we're meeting, and you say tomorrow, 243 days later, and she asks you, when are you getting married? Uh, about three years' time. May the force be with you, brother. We think uh, on earth, 24 hours, 365. And that's what he did. He created Venus, He created Jupiter, He created Pluto, He created everything. Yet, He confined Himself to the 365 days. And He said to Himself, Father, I'll be the man so that I can feel my people. This is Christmas. And lastly, worship team can come. Extended grace for human weakness, wickedness. Look, in Genesis 6, 5, it says, The Lord observed the extent of human wickedness on the earth and He saw that everything they thought or imagined was consistently and totally evil. Really evil. <laughs> really no good. In chapter 7, God destroyed the earth with the flood. Let me ask you, after that, what happened? Do you know that the earth continued to deteriorate morally? Sin abounded even more? Sin became worse, wars, and, and earthquakes, and, and killing, and murder. I mean, you're talking about Genesis 6-5, the population then was so much smaller than now, yet the world became worse. That's why in John chapter 3, verse 17 says, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but that, that the world might be saved through Him even though the world continues to deteriorate. In chapter 6, verse 5, God, after that, chapter 7, God destroyed all the wickedness. But yet then, the in increase of wickedness, but yet God didn't stop. This is His love. This is grace. He still came. And people tell you, you listen to the grace message, teach you to go and sin more. Seriously? Seriously? If my wife loves me, tells me she loves me, what, what do you think I'm thinking? It's licensed to commit adultery. Which husband now will think that way? Your wife tells you, I love you, darling. License. I think it's absolute ludicrous to think that way. This is his love. That God sent his son. Not to destroy the world, not to condemn the world, but the world through him might be saved. We know John 3.16. We hardly think about John 3.17. That's the verse that I just quoted. God became man. What a great Christmas. What a great meaning. What an awesome God. Glory restored to mankind. Glory restored to mankind. Hallelujah. Come on, give Him praise everybody. Worship Him, come. Worship Him, come. Come on, lines.
Isaiah 62 says, Darkness as black as night covers all the nations of the earth, but the glory of the Lord. Darkness covers the earth, but the glory of the Lord fills the earth. And that glory is Jesus Christ. Because the Father's glory is shining on Jesus. And He is Emmanuel, God with us. Come on, stand to your feet. Give Him praise. Give Him a shout of praise.